Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Triton Entrepreneur Night. Tonight is really a night about celebrating student innovation at UC San Diego, and it's our first time doing it virtually. So my name is Taylor, and I am your virtual MC tonight. I graduated UCSD in 2018 with a degree in bioengineering, and I currently work as a product engineer at Illumina. I'm so grateful for my experience with The Basement because I really was able to learn foundational business concepts, which I really wouldn't have gotten through my engineering degree. So needless to say, I'm so grateful for the entire entrepreneurial community at UC San Diego. And this night is about bringing those people together. So let's kick off this event with a musical performance by UC San Diego undergraduate student, Luis. Hi there, my name is Luis. I'm a third year cognitive science student and I will be playing La Vian Rose for you. Please enjoy. Entrepreneurship comes in all forms of creativity. Share your passions with others and risk being vulnerable. It will pay off now and in the future. Thanks so much, Louise, for that awesome performance and those wise words. Next, we'll hear a message from Paul Robin, Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Commercialization. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Robin. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Commercialization at UC San Diego. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to Triton Entrepreneur Night. So this is the night where we celebrate the students and the success and the achievements of the students over the past year. Um, innovation is, of course, hugely important uh, to UC San Diego. And it's been my privilege over the past two months to witness just how innovative this campus can be. People have dropped what they were doing previously. They have refocused, they have collaborated, not just across this campus, but across the, our entire region to develop um, ideas and innovative solutions to help us get through this COVID crisis that we're all living through at the moment. And indeed, some of those solutions are going to make San Diego one of the safest places to live in the country um, once we do get out the other side of this crisis. And the student contribution to that innovative culture is not insignificant, it's huge. And that's really what the basement is about here. It's to help support and develop that culture of innovation amongst the student body. Um, we view the university as having a number of, respons of responsibilities for the students. One, of course, is to give them the specific knowledge they're going to need to be successful in a particular career. But the other really is to help students to develop those core skills that will help them be successful contributors to societies as individuals, irrespective of the career that they choose. And that's what the basement does. It provides an environment um, supported by mentors and an experience to allow students to develop within themselves the experience, the confidence and the skill sets that they're going to need to be successful as human beings. 
Um, it also helps to develop a community, a community of the students themselves, a community between the students and their advisors and mentors and people who run this program. And we hope that the students will be able to use that community as a jumping off point um, to enable them to be successful um, in their lives after UC San Diego, irrespective of what they, it is they choose to do. So with that, I just want to thank a couple of people. Um, the executive board of The Basement um, has really stepped up over the past year to not just support The Basement, but help us to grow and be better and get to the uh, next level in terms of a program for the students here. So thank you to each and every one of the executive board for their contributions, and particularly to Jeff Belk, who chairs the board, who you're going to hear from next. I also want to thank all of the sponsors. Without you guys, we couldn't do this. Um, so thank you to each and every one of you. Your support is, is hugely appreciated. And lastly, I want to thank Gloria, Christine, and um, the newest member of the basement, Jack, who put all the effort into not just tonight, but working with the students over the course of the year. So with that, I look forward to the presentations and I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you, bye. Thanks so much, Paul, for those that inspiring, oh, excuse me, inspiring message. Um, now we'll transition, as Paul mentioned, to a message from Jeff Belt, the Executive Basement Board Chair. Good evening. I'm Jeff Belk, and welcome to Triton Entrepreneur Night. Five years ago, the basement was founded with the vision of the university and support from my wife, Kim, and I, Arya Borkoff and Mark Suster. It's been our pleasure in these last five years to support the basement as it's grown and adapted over time as all entrepreneurial endeavors should do. From the start, the basement was about incubating students. There are a lot of commercial incubators out there and their focus is on what sort of rounds they get, what sort of financing they get, what sort of partnerships they get. And of course, that's a part of the basement. But more than anything else, the basement is about finding a place for students to come together in a compelling space with great professional support, fantastic staff, peers that help them every bit along the way, and an ever-increasing passionate mentor base. Also from the very outset, the basement has been very unique in a university environment as the students, as they develop new projects, actually own their own intellectual property something that we initially had to go to the office of the president of the University of California to get. Now this philosophy for the students has been manifested in a couple of ways. In my mind, going back to the very beginning of the basement, it's not about whether the ventures succeed or fail. It's not about whether they get funding. It's about giving students the opportunity to come together, come up with an idea in the entrepreneurial spirit and be able to focus on those ideas and build them. If the students succeed, if all you guys out there succeed with your project, fantastic. If you get a passion for being an entrepreneur, even better. But if you fail, guess what? You might have to try again. And if you fail a second time, you might want to try again as well. And frankly, over time, you're going to decide whether you want to have the path as an entrepreneur or you want a path as uh, in the corporate world. What we found, however, is for all of the students, being part of the basement has enriched not only their student life, but enriched their professional life as well. We have alumnus of the basement who have founded and funded their companies and gone on to grow them, such as Nanome, who's probably here tonight somewhere online. One of the early successes of the basement were three students who actually sold their product to Bose. Other people have ended up in fantastic positions in technology companies around the globe. So we're proud to have you at Triton Entrepreneur Night. We're proud of what we've achieved. And for us, the most incredible thing is seeing the passion, seeing the pitches we're gonna to do tonight, and seeing the real spirit of the basement embodied, whether we're in person or virtual. So again, everybody stay safe, and I'm proud to be a Triton, and I'm proud to be part of the basement. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much for that message, Jeff. Without further ado, we'll transition to our main event, the pitch competition. So a quick reminder that our Audience Choice Award voting closes after intermission tonight. So remember to get your votes in before intermission ends. So now I'd really like to congratulate our six finalists, Botticelli, Crater, LearnSesh, Mize, Time, and Vibrant. This worked a little bit differently this year. 
So each team recorded, um, actually pre-recorded a five minute pitch. And after each live pitch is played, judges will have five minutes of actually live Q&A. So speaking of judges, I'd really like to welcome our judges and invite them to quickly introduce themselves. And we'll begin with you, Anne. There, there, it requires me to unmute myself and my video as well. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anne Crady Weiss, and uh, I went to UCSD many years ago. I'm a psychology major. Um, I do nothing with psychology at all in my professional life now. I do two things professionally. Um, number one, I'm the CEO and founder of a venture-backed startup called Hatch. Um, we help people get good sleep. Um, it's actually my second venture-backed company. Um, and uh, I also am part-time a venture partner at a, at a firm called True Ventures. Um, we like to back, we like to write the first um, professional check you receive. And typically it's somewhere between half a million and $3 million. And we love crazy ideas. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, um, from you guys. Hi, my name is Eric Gasser. I'm the co-founder of Seed San Diego here in San Diego. Hi, I'm Leo Spiegel. Uh, professionally, I'm an investor and advisor to uh, a variety of startups and I've been involved in about 50 different startups and 25 exits and I'm proud to be a Triton. Hi, this is Kayleen Thorogood. I'm a former tech CEO in the big data and analytics world and now turned social entrepreneur. Awesome. Thanks so much, judges. I love that Triton pride. And thank you so much for volunteering your time to give feedback to these students. Without further ado, we'll move to our first team, Botticelli. As we continue to enter into the unknown and remain working from home, wellness is a priority. However, as America races to innovate, to build, sustainability must be at the core. From the air we breathe to the food we eat, Biodiversity is the foundation of human health. So when it comes to skincare, we must not compromise our environmental and personal standards. Let me introduce you to Botticelli. Botticelli is an online direct-to-consumer brand that transforms an underutilized resource into clean, sustainable, and custom-made skincare through immersive technology. Navigating through the wide selection of skincare can be daunting when you don't know what will work for you and the process for discovering what will is outdated. A one-size-fits-all approach does not work when it comes to caring for our skin. The factors that impact your skin health, including our living environment, vary from individual to individual. We need products that are tailored to our specific needs. But above all, we need products that are sustainable and non-toxic. Recently, there has been an aggressive shift in the market. For Gen Z, the digital nomads, eco-friendly and sustainable living is vital. Skincare is not about beauty. It's about wellness and self-care. As we rapidly transition into the fourth industrial revolution, digitalization is changing all industries as we once knew them. We want to offer you an immersive buying experience. And with the help of our AI powered assistant, we will create a product that it is unique to you, all while serving our planet. Let us give you a glimpse of how we operate. First, you sign up for a free consultation consisting of questions regarding your lifestyle, skin goals, and environment. With this, our friendly AI assistant will formulate a personalized product recommendation with organic ingredients sourced by local farmers. In the future, we plan to innovate our e-store via a VR or gamified experience. Living in San Diego has many benefits. Most importantly, we care about our ocean. This is where we surf, live, and want to bring sustainable innovation to blue economies. Each year, more than 7 million tons of Moloch shell waste from the growing seafood industry ends up in landfills or pollutes the waters. When we don't recycle, reuse and reduce, we destroy natural habitats. When it comes to waste, don't look at what it is. Look at what it has the possibility to be. At Botticelli, every formula starts from the ocean, where we leverage underutilized seashell waste to create a highly effective base, knacker. Knacker is formed by mollusk, which in turn is the outer coating of a pearl. This super ingredient tackles many skin concerns, including aging, hyperpigmentation, and acne. Moreover, indie skincare brands, which are brands that enter the market through a disruptive strategy, are experiencing double to triple digit growth. And 67% of women like finding products made for their skin. The global skincare industry is valued at $532 billion, and we are aiming to enter the $54 billion sustainable skincare market. How? Let us tell you. We want to enter the market through the gaming industry, an industry that is worth $230 billion, while women make up $110 billion of it. More than two and a half billion people make up the online gaming community, and this number is only expect, expected to grow. Identified as early high-tech adopters, women make up 46% of this community and choose to not identify themselves as gamers due to inequalities. 
We want to empower this community and be the first to do so. We will leverage gaming streaming platforms, build a fan base on social media accounts, and look at non-traditional ways of raising awareness through placement advertisement on games. Our current competitors are competing on the efficacy of their formulas, but these formulas are either not sustainable or not truly personalized for one's needs. Other competitors are attempting to tap into the personalized skincare market, but their customer acquisition cost is too high. We are currently the only brand tapping into the zero waste and personalized skincare market with an organic growth strategy. Moreover, we stand out from our competitors with our AI-powered algorithm, unique buying experience, purpose-driven mission, and community empowerment. So far, we have developed our prototype base, established the website, and are working on our AI personalization tool. Our team is uniquely positioned to bring both the Chelly to success, especially with our experiences in the spheres of ocean sustainability, skincare, and emerging technologies. We aim to develop our team consisting of a world-class advisory board and are hiring for a formulation chemist and a UX UI designer. Our company is created for the people, so our stakeholders should be given the opportunity to help us co-create the next revolution of skincare. We are planning to using the Jobs Act by creating the first band-owned skincare brand. Our goal is to launch a crowdfunding campaign in the next six months. Well, the Chelly is more than just skincare. It's a movement for collective change and a shot at making the world just that much better. Today, let's remember that we have a small window of opportunity to bend the curve on biodiversity loss for the benefit of all life on Earth. We are asking that you join us in this movement. Thank you. And we are now accepting questions from the judges. Awesome. And with that, we'll move to our Q&A with the judges, again, beginning with Anne. It was nice to meet you guys. Um, I'm excited to learn more. So um, quick question. Your, um, your marketing strategy is that you are going to reach people, women on, who are gamers. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, part of our strategy is actually uh, to reach this consumer that's currently in the gaming industry. Um, it's expected to grow and COVID-19 has only, uh, you know, shot us forward to the future when it comes to digitalization. Um, moreover, you're probably familiar with this brand, Anne, as we uh, noticed that this company was actually on Shark Tank, Proven. Proven's uh, customer acquisition is actually 81% of their total revenue. So um, we're actually trying to minimize customer acquisition as we have currently interviewed uh, current uh, influencers on Twitch. Okay. I know we only have four minutes. I have a couple more questions, but I'll, let's let the other judges hop in. I'm good. Ask away, Anne. Um, so my, my other question is about, um, tell me about when you, when you say this is personalized, um, these are personalized products, tell me about what that actually means on the back end operationally. I, I'm assuming you, you're, you're, these are probably mass personalized. What does personalized mean to you? So personalized to us means that we're looking at your daily lifestyle, um, your diet, because all of that affects our skin. So we're taking all of these um, factors and we're processing, them through our, we're processing them through our consultation. And then with that, um, we have an algorithm that's fed uh, scientific journals and that those scientific journals tell us um, which ingredients are clean and sustainable for the skin. So then um, our personal, um, our AI friendly assistant will then recommend uh, formulas that are personalized based on factors that affect you. So that includes your zip code um, or even like what you eat on the day. Okay, so will you, I guess I'm still confused as to on the back end, like are you, are there 10 different um, types of women and and you will have 10 different formulations that then you can based on my survey send me one of the 10 are you truly individually formulating yes and, uh, also the way that we're aggregating this data and we're cleaning the data we want to make sure that all of the uh, formulations and all of our ingredients are actually sustainable clean and zero waste products so we actually want to go ahead and feed you clean ethical data as opposed to just feeding you scientific journals um, that have chemicals that have been proven to clean your skin or fix your, your skin issues, but are actually toxic. For example, talk. So I just want to interject here and um, let Leo and Paylene, if either of you have questions, um, and then we can circle back uh, to Anne afterwards. Sure, thanks. Um, you know, I was, I, Anne and I were sort of on the same wavelength. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand, again, is, is there like, an infinite number of formulations or a finite number of formulations. And then my other question quickly is, have you, and I know it's early and it's, it's a really cool company too, I really like it, but what do you, 
what do you think the gross margins are? Like, I'm just trying to figure out like what this actually business looks like from a monetary perspective. Yeah, so when it, when it comes to uh, our formulation base, which is the one that comes from the ocean, these are actually recycled seashells that come from the seafood industry. Um, so those are essentially free. Uh, our current product, our current prototype has been created through this like uh, free service, um, reaching out to uh, restaurant owners and uh, going, going ahead and cleaning the shells and creating our, our prototype. Right, so we are aiming to have a really um, low cost um, margin for creating the product, but we do plan on pricing the product from um, anywhere from 50 to $100. We're currently in the process to speaking to, a, um, to working with a consulting team at the Global School of Policy and Strategy. And um, we're really trying to narrow down our pricing strategy and figure out really how to optimize our uh, manufacturing process. So just 45 seconds left here, but Paley, if you have any questions. Sure, I, I do. Uh, and uh, mine is really around uh, unique differentiation and barrier to entry. Clearly, the sustainable, clean skincare market is booming. Uh, there are a lot of great players out there. I use some of them. What, what prevents them from doing something similar? How do you actually keep a competitive advantage? Right, so we do plan on being the first to tap in uh, to tap into the gaming community. There's currently no skincare brand that's tapping into this community, so we plan to be the first to really market to them. So these women um, are currently experiencing inequalities in this space, and we would be the first to um, really empower them and offer them an option that's um, suitable to them in the fact that um, we're offering a high-tech brand, something that they appreciate. Awesome. Thanks so much. And that's all we have for Q&A. So with that, we'll move on to our second team, Crater. Hello. My name is Eric Schnell. I'm an undergraduate in mechanical engineering at UC San Diego and the founder and CEO of Crater, where we're developing the first expeditionary 3D printer. For more on that a bit. In my hand here, I have the name Pellerfan to a fuel pump in a Humvee. It's a cheap, simple part. Only a couple cents to manufacture, and if you have it, it only takes a couple minutes to install. But that's where the problem lies, if you have it. If you don't, this cheap, simple part can mean the difference between life and death for over a dozen U.S. soldiers. Let me show you how. See, a part like this can take days, weeks, months, we've even heard of years to get where they're needed. But when you've got a part like this impeller fan, it can shut down an entire convoy in a hostile region. You can't wait days to get this part, let alone weeks or months. So what do you do? You carry spares of almost everything you might need. Forward operating bases have large cargo containers with spares, doubles, triples, of almost everything that they might need in the field. But there's inherent risk getting all that equipment into the field. In fact, when they leave a region, Oftentimes, they leave all that behind, or they destroy it to prevent it from falling into enemy combatants' hands, sacrificing the components to maintain their agility in a combat zone. Because there is inherent risk to moving anything in a hostile region. In fact, in Afghanistan from 2005 to 2009, there's a direct correlation between the amount of fuel spent transporting components just like this and lives lost due to IED. That is the real cost. American sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, lives lost due to a strained, inefficient supply chain. But it doesn't have to be that way. And that's why we're here. That's why we made Crater. Crater is a 3D printing platform that prints where no one else can through a combination of rugged, portable platform, SaaS software systems, AI-driven logistics, and blockchain encryption. We have identified key features by working with US Marine Corps and the Navy, small teams with them, to be able to revolutionize the supply chain. What does this 3D printer need to have? This is what we've identified as those key features. And as you can see, Markforge, Stratasys, huge names, both in the consumer and the defense side of the market, are just not listening to our soldiers, to their customers, to their stakeholders. They have, there's no wonder why it's taken so long for additive manufacturing to have the same kind of impact on the defense market than it has on the consumer market. We intend to change that, and so does the US military. They've allocated $292 billion to their operations and maintenance budget. Out of that, 
$250 million is specifically allocated to the development of expeditionary additive, additive manufacturing to solve this problem. And that's where we're targeting. We're doing that through a single unit contract that comes with a 3D printer, a three-year maintenance plan, and a SaaS software seat. It's sold essentially as a platform to start. With that, there'll be raw materials and consumer components sold as they are needed, as a sort of reoccurring revenue model, similar to how an HP printer revenue model works. Now, I mentioned that we work together with the US Marine Corps and the Navy as strategic technical advisors, and we have an upcoming beta test with them this summer. We're also in hoping to include the intelligence and special operations sectors who I work with Leavenhall. And we have also received support through the Blackstone Launchpad Lift program powered by Techstars, who has helped provide us funding for our initial MVP and given us their advisory support for the Techstars network. We're also working on the early stages of a partnership that I can't really go into a lot of detail on, but I can say that they are one of the largest 3D printing companies in the world and they share our vision and I hope to be able to share more soon. Now I mentioned that we've secured capital for our MVP, which we hope to have done within the next month or two. This summer, we'll be seeking an SBIR grant, which is a government grant. And we'll also be doing a scalability analysis, beta testing, so that we can be pre prepared for a seed round at the end of this year. We understand that despite us being student entrepreneurs who are very committed to this, we're young, we're inexperienced, especially when it comes to the typical defense market. So we have brought on the experience in our advisory board veterans of the U.S. Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy, all respected CEOs and founders in their own right, including Jenny Lawton, former CEO of MakerBot and CEO of Techstars. They are all critical to making this vision come true. Now, I know with COVID, it can be very hard for us to communicate. So if you have any questions or if you just want to reach out, feel free to email me or reach out to our website. Thank you very much for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy out there. Great, and with that, we'll move to some Q&A. Um, so that was excellent. Um, I loved how you presented the problem. I loved how you presented your solution. Um, I think there's a lot that you're doing that's very interesting. One of the questions I have is why are you working, you, you imply that you're working with a 3D printing company, why? Why not do it yourself? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. Um, we view it as uh, our, focus, our specialty is being able to adapt technologies to survive in the uh, field. And that is based off of our experience working with the Marine Corps and the Navy. Um, and we view it as we've done 3D printing. I have over a decade of experience in 3D printing, both as a hobbyist and an educator. Um, but we don't need to revel we don't need to reinvent the wheel, essentially. There are companies out there that have spent millions of dollars and decades of work researching and developing the best methodologies for 3D printing. So if we can take what we're best at, this ruggedization, portability, and our connections to uh, the armed forces, and combine it with their experience, their knowledge, their research, then in the end, we have a better product and we can better serve our stakeholders. Um, all right, I've got a question. So what's the secret sauce then? What makes it, what makes it special? Exactly, yeah. So our, our focus is uh, the bit ruggedization and portability and capabilities. So by working as strategic advisors with certain units in the U.S. Marine Corps and the Navy, we have been privy to uh, identifying key features that are necessary um, for survivability. Um, and we have worked to develop and research those technologies directly with those units over the last couple of years whether that be um, isolation systems to capture exhaust from 3D printing to prevent um, people getting sick off the fumes, or whether that be uh, being able to make it more survivable, droppable, for example. So 3D printer is a precision technology and you can't just drop it and expect it to survive, let alone stay in calibration. But we've developed subsystems um, and technologies that essentially are able to adapt um, to being dropped and be able to uh, restore itself to being operational again, which are which is can't go into a lot of detail yet, but uh, is kind of a lot of our secret sauce and what we've spent a lot of our time working on so far. All right, thanks, Eric. Leo. What, Thank so, yeah, what, what are there any particular security issues? I, I noticed you know some of the technologies you're using. I'm wondering how you're thinking about security relative to this solution. 
um, focus on cybersecurity mostly or in general? Yeah, no, yeah, on the cyber side, I would think, yeah. Cyber side, excellent. So one of the things that we've been working on with them is integrating into their already existing network solutions. Um, there is an inherent risk of, if you're transporting parts like this, of not only having these part files be stolen from somebody, but also there is destructive integration. So what some, uh, one of the risks they're looking into is somebody taking one of these files, modifying it so it'll break in some way, and then re-injecting it back into the system. So we've been working directly with the Marine Corps and another unit, uh, uh, sorry, another startup team out of um, uh, USC who is working on kind of more of the digital solution. I mentioned blockchain was one of the integration methods we want to use. Um, and they are very much focused on just that aspect. So we will likely actually going forward partner with them because the, that's their major focus. So we've got our major focus. And we think the end result, this big old platform, will have the best uh, result with their input as well. Really? Uh, great uh, answers to all the questions. I really enjoyed the presentation and how thoughtful you are about the opportunity and the partnerships. I'd love to hear uh, what keeps you up at night. What do you think are the biggest risks or the obstacles ahead of this? Because it really looks very interesting and you appear to have the right ecosystem around you. Mm -hmm. um, I get, God, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, so I guess what keeps me up at night is um, finding a way to bring this all together for, I guess, in the end, the stakeholder. There's a lot of people at play. We've got our niche in what we're focusing on, and we want to try and bring people together to kind of create this solution, I mean, whether that be us at the forefront or whether we be assisting on it. Um, but the end result is we've identified this problem, and we want the solution to the problem. I mean, it's be that we're all engineers on the team, and our focus is the stakeholder. But what keeps me up at night is making the best possible solution for our soldiers and for our potential customers. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Thank, thanks so much, judges, for your questions and Eric for your answers. Now we'll hear from our third team, Learn Sesh. Hi, I'm Glenn Carlisle. And I'm Isaiah Weiss. And we're Learn Sesh, the virtual reality tutoring tool. Now, for some context. Students, even A-plus mathletes, can become confused, frustrated, and discouraged when faced with new, complex, and abstract concepts. I know this from personal experience. I'm sure many of you know it as well. You can go to YouTube or other video resources, but they don't explain the nuances of the problem. And by the time you realize you need a tutor, they're either too expensive, it's too late, or frankly, they're inconvenient. During our research for our company, we found that students don't only have to choose between more effective in-person learning and more convenient remote learning, but there's a surprising lack of tools to help explain these complex abstract concepts in a way that's much easier to understand. Virtual reality makes it possible to teach abstract concepts both effectively and conveniently. Today, virtual reality headsets no longer require external computers, have drastically increased their comfort and immersion, and are trending towards becoming cheaper now costing about the same price as a mid to low tier laptop. The transition towards online learning tools, such as online whiteboarding, provides a complementary market opportunity to these technological advancements. The rapid growth of the online tutoring industry highlights this, which is estimated to reach over $100 billion by the year 2023, with a 15% compounding annual growth rate. During our customer discovery process, we realized that tutoring firms need better tools to teach these complex abstract concepts in a way that they can still retain effective in-person learning, yet compete with these remote convenient options. After talking to tutoring firms from around the country, we have now identified our initial target customer to be high school to college math-focused tutoring firms who are teaching higher income students. LearnSesh uses virtual reality to teach complex, abstract concepts in a way that preserves the effectiveness of in-person learning while offering the convenience of remote tools. Our alpha version offers real-time collaboration and voice chat, has whiteboards you can save and export so you can do your homework in virtual reality, and 360 degree workspaces that are persistent. We're also working on web browser integration, session recording and review, and creating a starter library of 3D models and animations. While we'll initially be doing these in-house, we'll be allowing users, designers, and experts to upload and commission sell educational content in our platform. In doing so, we're ensuring that 
no abstract or complex idea goes without supplemental material to make it that much easier to learn. LearnSesh is a B2B SaaS company with tutoring firms as primary customers. Tutoring firms will be able to license our software and distribute it to their students and tutors. We will have 3D model and animation packages available for purchase, and we'll also generate data on learning and virtual reality environments in order to generate additional revenue streams. One bottleneck that we identified is that some students and tutors may not already own virtual reality headsets. To combat this, we plan on connecting tutoring firms to virtual reality headset rental companies in order to alleviate initial fixed costs. As we scale, we plan to negotiate discounts for headset rental and headset purchase. Given there are over 3,000 tutoring firms in the United States alone, we believe that our year-end goal of reaching 100 tutoring firms and attaining 1,000 customers to be conservative, which would generate roughly $100,000 per month in revenue. We've already received interest from tutoring firms in multiple states, with one tutoring firm asking to become a day-to-day -day partner. We have a unique advantage creating a product in this space. Our experience spans from mixed reality marketing to working in startup studios. You can see on the slides some of our network who gave us mentors for feedback. And we have two virtual reality development advisors, Professor Jurgen Schultz and Trinex our president, Justin Park. Since January this year, we've assembled an amazing team, created a great product, and with our current resources, are looking to be operation sustainable by fall. However, we are seeking additional funding. This will help us accelerate development in response to COVID, run additional trials, and have our legal documentations reviewed. As for the future, once we refine one-on-one -on -one education, we're looking to expand to the greater education system, where we know we can make a greater impact. But for now, we're LearnSesh, the virtual reality tutoring tool. We'd love to connect with people and get any feedback we can, so if you'd like to contact us, please do so at info at LearnSesh.com. Again, I'm Glenn Carlisle. And I'm Isaiah Weiss. And thank you for your time. We'd love to hear your questions and comments. Great. Nice job, guys. Um, you definitely, um, COVID has certainly been good to you um, in terms of the online learning market is booming for sure. Um, um, one of the, my first, my, my question is, what portion of the learning and tutoring market is made up of abs these abstract concepts that you guys um, address particularly well? So um, what we found through our research, um, talking to different tutoring firms, about 30% of their students are faced with these higher level math um, problems like um, calculus or chemistry or physics. So we're trying to target those different, um, th those segments of the science math oriented um, customer base. Thanks. Um, why are you guys the right ones to solve this problem? Uh, so we've got um, experience from mixed reality and kind of this virtual reality environment as well as serious startup studios. Mm -hmm. So we're already positioned to kind of solve this problem. But furthermore, um, we've got a lot of personal drive. I know from personal experience in third grade, I was great at math, was with the advanced fifth and sixth graders doing high school math. And I went from learning multiplication and division to Pythagorean theorem with no in between. And that was the last day that I ever liked math. I went to my class, I was crying. I, I have a hard time connecting with it. So we're really driven to prevent these kind of discouraging um, and long-term effect experiences, uh, just preventing them from happening. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Well, there's just a big difference between like knowing that you have a problem or living through a problem and being the educator or the problem solver to the solution. So I'm glad that you have a couple other people on the team that can kind of fill in those gaps and that you've got the passion to kind of figure out that, hey, you want to solve this for other people. Um, all right. Thanks. And then if Leo? I can respond to that uh, real oh, quick. Sure. sure. Um, I think one great thing about our team, um, and it was actually one of our bottlenecks in the beginning, was finding the right personnel who can um, do a wide range of um, jobs from multiplayer networking to 3D model animation. So we took our time to really build a proper team um, and then having this wide, diverse range of um, work experience from mixed reality to entrepreneurship. Uh, myself working in a startup studio provides us we finally have the right team to deliver the solution now, which took time, but um, we believe we're more than capable of delivering this. Find more people like Glenn. Leo, go ahead, man. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I really, uh, good job. I, uh, think, I think it's a cool idea. Um, what, what are the, you know, you guys are a little bit above like the platform and I love the idea of the channel strategy of working with these training companies, but 
the content, getting all the content, I think is going to be a challenge. How are you thinking about doing that? And, and you know, because it's only going to be as valuable as the content that the system has. Yeah, so one of the initial obstacles for content is we're focused instead of doing an AI, we want to have that preserved in-person tutoring. We, can, um, we think there's a lot of value in the soft communication, especially when people get confused, you can just point. But as far as the three models and visualizations, um, we're making, we're in talking to tutoring firms, finding the most com uh, common problems and making sure we address those models first. So we're initially hitting the, the biggest gap. And then from there, we're allowing it to open up so that users, designers, or experts, if they want to make some passive income, can sell across our platform. It's in the same way that um, like the Unity store allows other people to sell across it and they get their cut. But um, the main value to that is that there is a large amount of content that just is growing every year. Um, it's a bit how we would go about it. Great job, guys. Very interesting market. Clearly, there's a need for it. So uh, no question about the need to end the problem statement. Uh, my question is really keying off of what Eric said, uh, which is uh, there are many players out there with the connections, the contacts, the families, the students, so they already know who they are. And they would be able to develop a similar solution may not be identical, but they can go to market quickly because they already know the marketplace. So what prevents them from going ahead of you or how do you think you can actually go ahead of these people who already have the you know, connection somehow to the families in the education market? So we're kind of solving a problem from the middle. Um, there's two sides to it. There's the tech side and then there's the tutoring side. Um, so we're kind of the bridge there. The tech side, um, so far none of the companies that we've seen or heard about really are servicing this exact market. Um, I think our biggest competition would be like Rumi or Verbella, but they're doing it with not a VR first and embodied experience, but more of a laptop, which has less workspace and other setbacks. But uh, for the tech companies, for example, Oculus, who does some collaboration, they would have to drastically change their focus and offerings in order to service a tutoring market. So that's why we feel a little safe for now. We know that we've got an early mover advantage, at least. Okay, thank you so much. Best of luck. Great, and let's move on to now our fourth team, Mize. Mize, using big data to minimize EV to return. Went to have an event in three days. As I was shopping online, I found a really nice shirt and it was shipping in two days. So then I ordered a medium and a large. Tried them on, the large was a little too big, so I had to return it. Then I thought to myself, is there some sort of size guide that's able to help me with ordering the proper shirt? Well, there is. There's companies such as ASUS and M Taylor where M Taylor takes your measurements and tailors specific clothing right to you. ASOS takes measurements of your chest or waist, whatever measurements you need for the proper clothing item, and they'll also recommend the proper size for you. But the thing is, is there any some sort of a product that's able to take other people's preference of shirts and the proper shirts that they have to embed it on each specific company? So Mize aims to work like that. This way you have a Mize ID and you, you apply it on every single retailer that you shop at. So there's a rise in online shopping, especially with COVID where you hear companies like J.Crew and JCPenney that are going bankrupt and they're switching the majority of their products online. In 2019, online sales grew 23% to 3.9 billion, which is a 14% of net sales. And that's companies like Zara. And Zara is one of the biggest companies in the entire world when it comes to clothing. So we want to take a step back and gauge the impact of online returns on these bigger uh, clothing companies. So according to Nordstrom's 2019 10K, a 10% change in the sales return allowance, net of the estimated returns asset, would have had a 12 million impact on our net earnings for the year end of February 1st, 2020. Essentially, a 10% reduction in sales returns would have netted them an additional 12 million in the bottom line. And if we take into consideration that about a third of all returns uh, come from online purchases, in addition to the fact that about 80% of returns are due to sizing issues, uh, and we take a look at you know, some of the bigger companies, we aggregated their uh, net sales and found that it's about 80.3 billion uh, with 669 million in sales returns. Taking all those numbers from before, this translates to about 46.4 million that could be saved from reducing uh, sales returns that come from online purchases. With Mize. Well, step one, you have to create an account. This way we'll be able to create your Mize ID. So you input three to four shirts that you have and they fit you perfectly. Then we, again, we create your Mize ID by running to our algorithms. When we have, when we create your Mize ID, we'll, first we'll start off with shirts and then we'll jump into uh, jeans and all the other clothing items. But then we create your Mize ID. When you have your Mize ID, you just have to just shop and we just recommend proper size for you. 
So that's me here shopping my first time at Uniqlo. I don't have to worry about my sizes. I just click the Mize icon and I go add to cart and that'll be it. So there's a difference between a Mize user and a Mize customer. The Mize users are everyday online shopper and they, they don't have to worry about paying anything. They're just, they're just helping us up with the data. We have the Mize customer, which is an online retailer such as Nordstrom, Zara, and all those big companies. We charge, them a small, we charge them a small fee compared to the sales and the return costs that they're losing for us to operate. And we, they also prof, the, their profits will increase because we're also decreasing their uh, clothing returns and increasing their sales. This is our game plan. At first, we gather data, we optimize the algorithms, and we partner up with those small companies, such as where the piece and any of those small companies and start marketing and keep growing and growing and growing. Thank you to our supporters. We hope to maximize your online shopping experience with Mize. And thank you again. Thanks for the presentation. That was great. Um, so from a customer acquisition standpoint, are you, are you reliant on the retailer um, or do you have an independent customer acquisition strategy? So at first, our, our, our main goal is to, again, so we have the partner and we have our users. So at first, we're trying to get, we're going to use a little bit of marketing using Facebook ads and even collaborating with small companies to have our plugin be on their website. And when we have our plugin on their website, people, their users will create the, our account with, with, their, with their website. So if I'm a Gap user and I already have my Gap account, I'll automatically just sign up for my Mize account and it'll just be embedded together. Um. There's been, there's like a landmine of people that have tried to do this. Mm -hmm. so, um, so help me understand some of the research you did on historical competitors mm -hmm. that died or not really competitors, right? But mm -hmm. that kind of environment and why you guys are the ones to solve this problem now. Okay. So uh, there's companies such as like Fit, Fit Analytics where they're, they're mainly <laughs> the focus in terms of like measurements and so on. Yep. So Mize's approach is different where we're mainly focused on data. So think of it as like, if we have a huge influx of data, we have a huge number of data of people that inputted the shirts that they have and we start creating relationships with the shirts that they have. And this, this model first will be, we'll apply this model on shirts. So that means the difference between us and Fit Analytics and these other companies, whether they failed or they tried it and it didn't work out for them, is we're not basing off of measurements. Because if you think about it, like if my chest is a 40 inch, but I'm more of a loose fit, uh, a loose fit type of person, I might not, if, if, if my size is 40 inch, I'm supposed to get a medium, I might prefer a large. But if I input my shirt that I have, that will just automatically personalize my, my account and my preference. So whenever I shop, I'll be able to implement it. And another- I want you to not lose track of the fact that nothing's ever cut the same. Mm -hmm. so yes, yes. Just, so as you as you as you move forward, mm -hmm. just be aware. No matter what measurements Eddie Bauer sends you, mm -hmm. um, the shirts never fit me the same. They fit me great in the store, but never the one that comes in the mail. So just be aware of that, um, Leo. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. So, so you're your model will be then to charge the retailers. Yes. And, um, and will you charge them sort of a flat fee or a fee per transaction? Or how are you thinking about, I mean, their retailers are really cost conscious mm -hmm. and they're really tough to sell to. Yeah. So I think it's critical to really figure out a, a value proposition and a pricing model that's easy to adopt if you're a Nordstrom or one of these kind of people. Mm -hmm. So obviously it will be, uh, so when we approach the retailers, it's going to be depending on each retailer and, and what's the return cost. So if we, when we approach Nordstrom, the return cost will be a lot more compared to some, a small company that just started off in someone's garage or a small surf shop, right? So those companies, we look at their return costs and we'll, and, and using our testing and what we have, what our prototype would be, which we'll, we'll be testing it throughout the summer is we show them the percentage of how much they'll be saving in their return costs. And then we'll charge, depending on that return cost that we're saving the money from them, we'll charge them that fee. So again, like Shihai was explaining earlier, is if the person, if they're spending $12 million, right, for return costs throughout the year, if we're saving uh, some sort of percentage, we'll, we'll be charging that percentage initially. But obviously, as we decrease the return cost, that number will change. So then from then on, we'll start, we'll adjust that number, we'll, we'll work something out with the, with the retailer and base off of their sales at that point. 
So I want to get into the product a bit more. So where are you guys with the algorithmic development? So do you have, have you actually attempted to do this with different types of shorts, different types of people? And is it giving you close enough results? How much data do you need to actually get to mm -hmm. a point where it's good enough? Because mm -hmm. with data, it's all about how much data you have to mm -hmm. come to something that's representative. So I just want to kind of see where you are with the thinking and the algorithms. So it's going to be all about that. Otherwise, you know, it's a yes. great idea, but. <laughs> so uh, in terms of like what number we need of certain data, obviously the, the bigger the number, the better. We first, that's, we're, we're, at first we're trying to aim for just specifically just shirts and collaborating with small companies. Right now we're almost, we're, we're, we'll be pretty much done by end of June with our algorithms. And that's when we'll launch our product. To test our product, we'll also be launching a shirt, which is like our purse, like a shirt, just a nice shirt that we have a design on it. And we'd have our user just input the shirts that they have and they just automatically go to the buy button. So this way they, they experience how our product would feel. So that means if the shirt fit them perfectly and we get the feedback back from our users. So in terms of the number, the, our goal is to first approach small companies to get a certain number. And then from then on, we'll go on to bigger companies. Thank you. No That's problem. a lot. Great. Thanks judges. Now we'll move on to our fifth team time. Hello everyone, I'm Reese. I'm a current transfer junior at UCSD and the co-founder and CEO of TIME. And I'm Kristen, co-founder and COO of TIME. Every 73 seconds, a person in America is sexually assaulted. That's four people just in the duration of this video and over 400,000 annually. And 23% of these individuals are college students. Only five out of 1,000 perpetrators will ever be convicted, in part because of only one out of four sexual assaults are reported. And even still, one out of four of these reported cases lead to lawsuits against the university, causing them millions. Why? Because the reporting process is terrible. First, if a survivor waits to report, their stories are often invalidated, meaning that survivors are forced to choose between reporting their assault and healing. Secondly, if they do choose to report, they often lose control over the reporting process and experience secondhand trauma from the added stress. Finally, throughout this entire process, Sirens often feel abandoned and alone as they process their trauma. Time is a three-part solution to these issues. Our first phase will include a web-based reporting platform where survivors can document their experiences at their own pace. Our interview-based question set will be broken down into smaller sections so that survivors can choose which category they feel comfortable completing at a given time. Survivors will also be able to upload photos, recordings, and other evidence so they don't have to keep triggering information on their personal devices. If and when the survivor is ready, time will generate a timestamped report that can be taken to the authority of the survivor's choosing. In the future, time will be a mobile advocate that takes the administrative burden off of the survivor's shoulders and a healing community where survivors can connect with one another and resources in their area. The reporting process is also a problem for universities. A United Educators report in 2015 showed that a sample group of 1,600 colleges and universities spent an average $350,000 over four years settling complaints from alleged victims in court, with some settlements reaching well over a million dollars. These figures don't include legal fees, and in recent years, universities have begun paying for insurance to cover these payouts, and the costs simply don't end there. Often, university administrators don't know about mishandled cases until it's too late. These lawsuits tarnish university reputations and have even shown to lead to lower rates of admission. For example, in 2014, Dartmouth saw a 14% drop in admission following a mishandled sexual assault case. Time will help both survivors and universities by improving the reporting process. Operating as a nonprofit, Time will ge generate revenue through partnerships with Title IX offices and risk management divisions of universities. For a yearly fee per student, Universities partnered with Time will be able to add specific questions to Time's base question set, making it an even more comprehensive and usable report. If the survivor's university is partnered with Time, they will be given the specific set of questions to answer and bring to the Title IX office whenever they feel ready. Throughout the reporting process, survivors will be issued surveys regarding the way in which their case is being conducted. Time will then provide the university with data from this feedback in order to better understand how they can support survivors through the reporting process regardless of a case's outcome. In doing so, they were able to avoid any future litigation for mishandled cases. With our solution, survivors will be able to be given the time and support they need to heal, while universities will be given feedback that could help save them millions of dollars. The average statute of limitations for assault reporting in America is 10 years, 
meaning that our total available market is the over 4 million individuals who have been assaulted during that time. Our system available market is the nearly 1 million of those individuals who are college students, and our potential early adopters are the one in four of those survivors who are most likely to report their cases. With about 5,300 universities in the country, there is also ample market for potential partner organizations. Various other reporting apps exist, but none quite like ours. Our competitors, Callisto and Jado's models differ in the fact that their end goal is to connect survivors with litigation teams based on the identity of repeat offenders. Reports can sit in a database for years until a case with the same perpetrator arises. With time, cases are never inactive. With the generated written report, survivors can choose to go forward with their cases without having to wait for another match. We put survivors first, period. Our revenue model doesn't depend on cases filed, so the focus is entirely upon supporting the survivor throughout the healing process. Thus far, we've begun building our website in a working prototype of the reporting function. We'd like to beta test this feature next month. Our most pressing costs include funding a sizable and secure database to ensure the confidentiality and security of user information. We are also looking to invest in marketing campaigns and to bring on two more team members, one in business and one in tech. Our long-term goals include implementing the mobile advocate and healing community features by the end of the year. In light of Betsy DeVos's new Title IX regulations, survivors now more than ever need a space where they feel empowered to share their stories and get support while doing so, because survivors should never have to choose between reporting their experiences and healing. On behalf of everyone at Time, thank you. That's great. Um, nice job. Um, it is super sad that it is as big an addressable market as it is and good for you guys for trying to do something to help. Um, my biggest question about the business itself is user acquisition. How do you, how do you get the word out? There are, I actually personally looked at a few of these, including Callisto, and how, how, do, how are you different and how do you win versus other folks? So a big reason of why we're different is that we allow assault, report, uh, assault survivors to be able to report without needing another match. So Callisto and Jado require you to be matched with, a, with another survivor that has a similar case. And they use that as a way to both validate and also inspire survivors to report. We wanna give survivors the ability to file a written report immediately, as soon as they want, or the ability to document it for as long as they want. So a key reason we're different is that we allow survivors to go forward first. And how we wanna get that word out is both through our partner universities and also through social media marketing as well. Thanks. I don't have any questions. Leo? Yeah, so, um, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, huge kudos to both of you and to your team. Um, being a business guy, I'm just trying to figure out who's going to pay for it and how you make money. Sure. So, as we mentioned a little bit in our video, um, there was a report that showed that universities pay an average of $350,000 per year, or over four years, I'm sorry. Um, settling cases and one extreme example was a Penn State case in 2017 that amounted to $109 million. So our solution is a fraction of the cost. We'll operate as a nonprofit with yearly subscriptions per student. We're thinking the university would pay somewhere between 50 cents and a dollar per student. So a school like Scripps, for example, would pay about $1,000 per year, whereas UCSD would see something like fifteen to $30,000 per year. Thank you. My question has to do with the um, adoption of the competitors. You mentioned several companies who are approaching it from different perspectives. Uh, how many of the 50 plus thousand universities out there have adopted a similar solution and how well have they done? I mean, there's no question this is a serious issue. I'm just trying to figure out uh, how, how the universities are reacting and if any similar solutions have been adopted in any successful manner. Of course, um, so basically about uh, a couple years ago, uh, Cal uh, Callisto launched, and they have about 12 partner universities. But when we brought this uh, idea up to the dean of students at Arizona State, she had never even heard of a solution like this. And she was very, very, very interested on uh, bringing on time and time services as soon as we had um, a working prototype to um, present to her. But I just wanted to have a sense of, uh, you know, I'm sure if you talk to a specific university, they may show a lot of interest. I'm just trying to get a sense of adoption of similar solutions out there. Um, if any other universities have done anything outside of having appropriate insurance or dealing with the situation after the fact, um, mm -hmm. is what's the adoption rate? So how are they gonna be receptive to having a, a solution that's maybe better than what they have? Or is this gonna be totally a new concept to them? So, um, 
in the past, I think three years, Calista has grown from just their uh, starting university to about 12 different universities, um, including Stanford and Scripps. Um, so the adoption rate has been uh, pretty successful for, uh, for them. They're around a $2 million company. So we hope that uh, we'll see uh, similar success. Can you, can, can you take me through like, hey, you get a new customer? Of course. Hypothetically, <laughs> like you get a new customer. Okay, now what? Like, how do you, how do you support your customer in getting the word out? So basically what we plan to do is we provide them with a question set. They can go through it at whatever pace they want to. We break up the questions so they're really easy to manage. We've been working with professors to make the wording as palatable as possible, as well as working with investigators to create the type of questions that they could use in their reporting process. Um, after they complete the full question set, they can decide to either sit on the report or move forward. They can sit on the report for as long as they want. Their questions are time stamped, so they don't lose any uh, valid or uh, they don't lose any credibility um, by waiting to report. Um, when they do want to go forward, we want to be that mobile advocate for them. We want to help them throughout that entire process. So eventually, by the end of this year, we hope to be able to take the steps of contacting the university for them if their university is partnered with us. If not, we provide them with a written report that they can take to um, their uh, Title IX department. So basically, a written report lets them substitute their initial interview for this written report, and it basically starts the reporting process for them. It's unfortunate we have to have yeah. your product. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we have about eight seconds left. Um, are there any final squeeze in questions? All right. Well, then, thank you so much for your questions and answers. And with that, we'll move on to our final finalist, Vibrant. Hi, my name is Tiffany, co founder of Vibrant, and we're creating color changing fibers to reduce textile waste. In fashion's linear take-make waste model, 73% of clothing material ends up burned or tossed into the landfill. Less than 1% actually gets recycled back into new clothing material. And even if the fashion industry were to increase that percentage up to 40%, which is their target goal by 2030, it still wouldn't have as much of an environmental impact, only reducing carbon emissions by 3 to 6%, because the rate of clothing production and consumption is expected to accelerate, like it has already done over the past 15 years. So not only do we produce more and we're buying more, but the average number of times you wear a piece of clothing before it's disposed of is actually going down, decreasing by 36%. Vibrant's patent pending fibers allow the end users a completely new way of reusing their clothes by changing its color. Our minimum viable product is created using RPET, a material that comes from recycled plastic water bottles. And the way it works is that we would supply our unique transparent fibers to fashion brands to produce these garments. The end users would then go to their local retail stores and purchase these transparent garments and choose the color right then and there when with our dye dispensers. Every time they like to change the color of their clothes, they'd come back to the retail stores. Therefore, this is actually a better way of matching supply with demand, which is something that fashion brands struggle with. Because for them, it may take anywhere from five weeks to nine months to create these clothes with their global supply chains. By allowing the end user to customize the color, fashion brands have a higher chance of keeping up with the trends leading to less unsold clothes and aged inventory, a problem that's costing them $50 billion every year. Our color changing technology skips several steps in the clothing production process, including dyeing, cutting, and sewing of fabric. Therefore, Vibrant can shorten the lead time for fashion brands, reducing the risk of overproduction. Our revenue streams would come from selling the cones of fibers, the dyes, and the dye dispensers to the fashion brands. Our competitors include another startup called Chromorphous that's creating a battery-powered clothes that changes color with the top of your smartphone. Textile manufacturers that are known for sustainability include Lensing, which is known for Tencel. Not only does Vibrant offer sustainable color customization, but we are also able to achieve on-demand production for fashion brands. Our earliest adopters would be fashion brands who have 3D knitting machines, which is essential for the integration of our technology into the existing process. 
We'll be producing footwear first because there is a lot less fibers needed before moving on to garments. And once we have our own funds to purchase our own 3D knitting machines, we can then offer that manufacturing service to other brands who are looking to lessen their environmental impact. Rothy's, one of our early adopters, has expressed interest in collaborating with us and we're continuing that conversation. Since they create shoes out of the same material and same technology, it will be a really great collaboration to have. And for us right now, it currently costs $20 to produce a pair of shoes. As a textile supplier of RPET fibers, Vibrant will be able to obtain a percentage of the 14 billion in the US segment for industrial yarn, which includes all sorts of fashion items from garments to footwear. We're seeking 45,000 in funding to further our R&D efforts, file for a patent and prepare for the pilot program. Over this past five years, we filed for a provisional patent and placed top 20 out of 5,500 in H&M's Global Change Award Innovation Challenge. We're, we apply, we're invited to reapply again next year with our working prototype. And recently we were awarded $5,000 in the UC Big Ideas contest which we'll be using this summer to begin customer testing with our MVP. We couldn't have done it without our multidisciplinary team of UCSD undergraduates and graduates and our group of dedicated mentors with expertise in tech commercialization, biomimicry, and sustainable fashion. So join Vibrant in redefining the three R's, reducing textile waste, reusing clothes in a completely new way, and finally, by using recycled materials to create color-changing clothing. Thank you. And I look forward to all your questions. Um, first of all, I think this is a super creative idea. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, I have two questions. One is, is this defensible? Like if you have, if you're massively successful here, isn't someone else just gonna rip you off? And if not, why not? So if we've already filed for a provisional patent to get us started with right now, like the color changing aspect of our technology is really like the structure the fibers are created out of. But not only that, but it's not only are we supplying the fibers, but we would also be supplying the dye dispensers to the retail stores. So it's this like widespread, like diverse range of products that all have to come together in order to make this color changing technology to happen. Um, one other, and it's more a comment than a question, but if I were you, I would be focused more on um, being on owning the whole supply chain versus being an ingredient supplier. That's just my two cents. Yeah, like that would be pretty cool. It's just right now, it's um, probably easier to work with other fashion brands, especially the 3D knitting machine that we'll need in order to turn our fibers into the full garments is really costly. So just having like a collaboration so we can try and test out how the users would experience our products in the stores would be really great before we start figuring out which sort of features we want to implement next. Um, my, sorry, one quick last comment is, it's easier to raise more money um, than to give your good idea to someone else. Anne's right, but I'm going to ask a, a, a little hypothetical question, which is, what does your company look like 10 years from now if you're crazy successful? Wow, our company, like 10 years from now, you'd see like these dye dispenser kiosks in your local retail stores, and potentially there'll be a design community where people can create their own mixtures of colors. So you see like those lipstick colors where they're naming it random like fancy stuff. And so it'll be like a really localized um, color, like unique experience to the end users. And not to mention like, for the fashion brands to themselves, it'll be a lot easier for them to produce like the clothes on demand. So they'll lessen their like environmental textile dye waste that they're currently generating right now. Hmm. So, um, I mean, really comprehensive presentation. I really like that you've thought through a lot of the angles. What is it like at the store when I bring my shirt or my shoes and I want to change the color? Is that a complicated long process how does that work we're trying to make it as less complicated as possible by doing user testing right now with our working prototype but ideally at the store it would be some sort of kiosk you can walk up to and insert your garment and just tap for the color that you want 
and we also like to keep track of like how many times you've changed colors with that garment so we can show you like how many potential like amount of water dyes you're currently saving just because you're reusing the clothes in a completely new way. Thanks. I'm going to talk about kind of maybe the market segment focus because I could ser certainly see this very applicable to certain segments. I doubt Leo is going to be using this anytime soon. So uh, I'm th trying to figure out how does it affect like, is it a very millennial focus? Is it certain types of products that would be uh, much better suited for you? Have you guys really honed in on the initial market opportunity to actually get started with this? I, I definitely see a very different markets reacting very different differently to this. Yeah, so one area where color changing has been like trying to be experimented with is in the shoes industry. Um, we're currently starting there just because it's easier for us to create the fibers needed and there's already a existing process. But like we do want to expand onto garments and all that sort. Wait, could you ask your question again? Sure. I, I was just thinking it should, uh, I wanted to hear more of a specific go to market focus with, you know, uh, specific demographics or specific types of products, uh, maybe specific price points because it's, you know, you want to look like you have more clothes, but you can't afford them. So, whatever the drivers are, so that you have a very clear market focus because it's a very interesting idea. But I think clarity of focus would really make this a lot more appealing to start with. Yeah, for right now, our customers that we're currently targeting would be those fashion brands that have 3D knitting machines, because that's a huge investment for them and they've already created clothing using that technology. So that's our current focus. And so some of the customer segments of our customers, so like the fashion brands, for Rothy's, the um, RPET shoes, they create like shoes for women ages 30 to 40s who want comf comfort while going to work. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to our judges for providing feedback and asking great questions. And a final thank you to all of our finalists. Um, thank you so much for putting on these awesome videos. And um, just, it was really great to hear about your inspiring ideas um, and uh, to see the momentum you're maintaining even during this COVID-19 crisis. So now we're gonna let our judges deliberate. So reminder, judges, if you haven't already, please mute yourselves and turn off your videos. And the rest of us will just have a brief intermission, but before we do that, just a quick reminder that the Audience Choice Award voting closes right after this intermission. So um, get your votes in real quick. Um, and now we'll hear from just a brief two minute musical performance again by Louise. <laughs> for watching. Now back to our main event. 
Great. Thanks so much, Louise, for recording those for us. They were absolutely gorgeous. Um, so just wanted to let the audience know that the Audience Choice Award voting has officially closed. Um, and for those of you who may be a little less familiar with what the Audience Choice Award is, uh, we had 10 teams total and a week of voting, and you could only vote once every 24 hours. So we just wanted to quickly honor and recap those 10 finalists. Um, so check them out right now. Hi, I'm Tamara Zubati, CEO and co-founder of Veracrypt. Our goal is to stop the spread of sensational news at the source. Winning Triton Entrepreneur Night last year opened a lot of doors for us. And during our time at the basement, we were able to learn from our MVP and discovered that we provide the most value to news providers, not news consumers. Armed with this insight, we began working with a local investigative journalism organization to better understand their needs and build out a business to business service. Veracrypt takes in text, such as news content, and outputs objectivity scores for the title, the content, as well as the author over time. We also provide a scored news feed with content aggregated from over 50,000 different sources. We presented our findings about bias in news at the Data West conference in December, and we're a part of an important panel about data ethics with powerful colleagues in the community. We are now continuing that research and plan to publish it later this year in the Journal for Data and Policy. Thanks to the network we built through the Data West Conference and the Block Lab, we were able to organize a trip to New York City in February where we met with representatives from organizations that are also affected by disinformation, including the New York Times, the United Nations, and the NYU Governance Lab. We are continuing all of those conversations that we started in New York, as well as conversations that we started over the last few weeks as people reach out to us when they're outraged by the news that they experience every day. We are currently on week two of the Georgia Tech Create X Summer Incubator. As we compete in this program over the summer, we're gonna be 100% focused on customer discovery and acquisition. And we can only do that thanks to the amazing progress that we were able to make on our product during our time at the basement. But the basement was so much more than that. Thank you so much for the amazing basement staff and mentors who pushed us and continue to push us to reach our fullest potential. Thank you to the dear friends that we've made at the basement who continue to be wonderful friends despite time and distance. Most importantly, congratulations to all of the entrepreneurs who competed tonight and to all of those working hard building your startups at the basement. Very crypto. Hello, everyone. Sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. That was actually Tamara Zubadi, as we found. Um, and she was uh, the, is the CEO and co-founder of Veracrypt, and she won first place at Triton Entrepreneur Night 2019. So thanks so much to Tamara uh, for giving an update on what Veracrypt has been up to. And I also just want to thank everyone who has been here tonight. So first off, thank you all so, so, so much for attending. We really appreciate you all being here. And a huge thank you to a few others. I know that um, Paul mentioned quite a few of them, but thank you to all of our sponsors. Again, this event would totally not be um, possible without this. And um, thank you also to all of our judges who are still in the process of deliberating. Thank you to our pitch competition reviewers and mentors, and thank you to our planning committee for uh, letting this event entirely go on. So um, I believe we can switch back to the PowerPoint slide, um, but bear with us for just a few minutes. Um, hopefully we can get that, uh, the recap of those, the 10 minute uh, recap of all of the finalists for the Audience Choice winner up and running in just a second. Thanks guys. Great, so now we're up and running again. Thanks again for bearing with us and check out these uh, videos. The performance enhancement market is diverse and different people require balance training or therapy, such as athletes and individuals with neurodegenerative diseases. With our first product, we aim to address the needs of people with Parkinson's disease. More than 93% of these individuals have gait issues. They are forced to spend large sums on physical therapy, which can improve their gait, but the positive effects of which can quickly wear off if it is discontinued. To maintain their gait and slow down the progression of their disease, people with Parkinson's disease require personalized, frequent, and long-term physical therapy. We've developed a solution that allows us to do just that. 
Parachute Insulin provides individuals with consistent supplementary therapy in between sessions with physical therapists, which can be performed in home. Our shoe install receives data using the sensors within and determines the user's state of balance. This allows us to provide real-time feedback on their therapy and help them improve their condition. Additionally, the install collects and analyzes gait data, which can be used by medical professionals to calibrate gait therapy for individual needs more effectively, as well as track progress over long periods of time. I think most of my life I felt Kind of like an outsider. I don't even realize anxiety is kicking in. I would not know how to act. What am I able to eat? What am I not able to eat? What am I going to As humans, we are bound to struggle with something in our lives, yet we often don't know how to feel about it. Is there something wrong with me? Should I tell someone? Who should I reach out to? Will they judge me? Or maybe this will just go away. We ask ourselves these questions because we're confused and we're afraid. We haven't taught ourselves as a community to deal with these challenges in a healthy way, which is why we created Real Life. Real Life's vision is to democratize the way we talk about mental health. Our platform is a co-creation of videos and stories by people from all walks of life. For someone who's facing adversity, our community provides an avenue to accept their struggle, seek guidance, and discover that their vulnerabilities are a sign of strength not weakness. With more stories, we can strengthen our community and expand the narrative of what it means to be human, to accept our vulnerabilities and overcome them. Let's rehumanize. Hi, I'm Damon Curtis, one of the co-founders of What's Cooking. Our app allows users to buy and sell homemade food on a local virtual market. Basically, sellers can upload the details of whatever they're going to be cooking and selling, and then buyers can scroll through an ever-changing virtual menu of what's cooking in their local area. Our goal is to create a market for cheap, safe, local, and delicious homemade food. Now let's take a quick look at the What's Cooking platform. So the user interface is pretty simple. We can choose to enter the app as a buyer or a seller. On the seller side, we can press the plus button to create a listing, view all of our current listings, and wait for the orders to roll in. On the buyer side, you can look at all of the current listings in your area and choose something you like. Let's say I want some veggie curry. I'll order four servings, place my order, confirm, and there you have it. So that's the What's Cooking platform. I hope you like it and thank you so much for your time. Hi everyone, I'm Reese. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Time. And I'm Kristen, co-founder and COO of Time. Every 73 seconds, a person in America is sexually assaulted, but only one of four cases will ever be reported, and it's no wondering why. Survivors lack a safe, supportive resource where they can document their assaults. They often lose control over the reporting process and often feel abandoned and alone as they process their trauma. Time aims to remedy these issues to a three-part solution. Our first phase is an online reporting platform where survivors can document their experiences at their own pace and then generate a written report that they can take to the authority of their choosing. In the future, Time will be a healing community and mobile advocate where survivors can connect with one another and resources in their area. Time's target users are survivors, but our business model depends on reporting entities. Time will work as a nonprofit, first partnering with Title IX offices and risk management divisions of universities in order to help them improve their reporting experience through survivor feedback. In light of Betsy DeVos's new Title IX regulations, survivors now more than ever need a safe space so they can feel empowered to share their stories and get support while doing so. Because survivors should never have to choose between reporting their assault and healing. On behalf of everyone at Time, thank you. Hi, my name is Griffin Middleman and I'm representing Savvy. Savvy is an online direct-to-consumer marketplace that rates the environmental impact of consumer products using lifecycle analysis techniques and reports those ratings to customers in an easy-to-understand manner as they shop online. We utilize a browser extension, a website, and an app to provide an ecosystem for ensuring our users get the best deal possible. By giving an easily comprehensible rating of the impact of potential purchases, consumers are informed of their environmental impact, allowing them to know the true cost of what they buy. They can then make purchases that are less energy and resource intensive, helping the environment. Our target customer is a person who cares about sustainability, is digitally engaged, and has the financial freedom to choose between comparable products while purchasing. This, namely, will be eight people aged 18 to 35 in middle and upper middle class areas of liberal cities in the Western world. But ultimately, we believe Savvy can benefit everyone. We'd like to thank you for your time and consideration for the Triton Entrepreneur Night Audience Choice Award. In tutoring, you have to make a choice. 
more effective in-person learning, or more convenient remote learning. Your choice can impact who you're able to get tutored from, whether you have to travel, and if you can record your sessions. But what if you didn't have to choose? What if you could learn in person from the most qualified tutors in 360 degree workspaces instantaneously from anywhere in the world? What if learning difficult abstract concepts like chemistry could be done with visualizations and dynamic 3D models that respond to your touch? What if you could relive your I get it moments and ensure they are never forgotten? What if this could be done anywhere, anytime, at home or on vacation? At LearnSesh, we're working to change what if to I can. Through the unprecedented capabilities of virtual reality, LearnSesh is making this possible. We're starting with high school to college math tutoring firms who want to create more effective in-person yet remote learning experiences. But our mission is to break barriers in all education. Welcome to LearnSesh, the future of learning. Hello, my name is Jan and I'm the founder of AI Evolution. With alien technology called the internet, we are more connected than ever. However, this also drives us apart. No matter how long we FaceTime each other, we can never get the feeling of connection like we have in person. People that suffer the most are people with limited physical abilities. Some children are homebound due to their health concerns, are missing out on a crucial part of life learning. There are the soft skills that we get from communicating with others. Statistically speaking, there are only 20% of students with disability attend colleges and universities, the environment where we learn and prepare ourselves for the real world. And we want to change that. With our product, the AR Bot, students will be able to interact with others on campus through a robot with intuitive control while still staying at home. We're targeting universities and corporations to implement this technology, allowing them to expand their talents and increase their accessibility. We look for your support to bringing those who cannot otherwise be present. My name is Jan and this is AR Evolution. Hi, we're Remora and we're developing autonomous marine drones to address oceanic trash pollution. We're doing this to help port and harbor authorities that lose nearly $700 billion in total from inefficient trash cleanup mechanisms as well as the regulatory fines and decreases in tourism. Our devices utilize machine learning algorithms combined with autonomous systems in order to actively predict where hotspots exist and relay this data to government agencies and researchers alike. Or Remora, clean solutions for sea pollution. Hello, my name is Anir Parabola, and I'm the founder of Zuppa, a startup that creates a technical platform for food vendors through machine learning and AI. The problem came when I was going to UCSD's farmer's market with my friends and one of my buddies told me he left class 10 minutes early just to be able to beat that 12 o'clock rush. This is where I got my idea to provide a service that allows consumers to skip those long lines. Upon talking to various food vendors, I realized there's no central technical platform for food vendors to operate on. So that's what I wanted to provide to these vendors through Zookta. Zookta is that platform where our users are food vendors as well as people who order from food vendors. We can build that consumer base by showing how our platform is easy to use and provides the best technical benefits to those food vendors. Food vendors sign up with a digital portfolio, which allows us to get the wider customer outreach. And through mobile ordering by the consumers, we can provide data analytics and algorithm-based recommendations for dynamic pricing and to just overall better streamline their process. And in all, Zipta changes the way food vendors operate in the U.S. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tiffany, co-founder of Vibrant, and we're creating color-changing fabric to reduce textile waste. In fashion's take-make-waste model, 73% of clothes ends up burned or tossed into the landfill. Vibrant's fabric allows fashion brands to reduce their production waste by shortening the time it takes to create clothes, which is normally 5 weeks to 9 months. By allowing the end user to customize the color, fashion brands have a higher chance of keeping up with the latest fashion trends, leading to less unsold clothes and aged inventories. As of right now, we've created a minimum viable product using RPET, which is a material that comes from recycled plastic water bottles. We completed our first prototype and it currently costs $20 to produce a pair of shoes. Our early adopters are sustainable fashion brands who have 3D knitting machines. We are currently talking with one of these. So join Vibrant in redefining three R's, reducing textile waves, reusing clothes in a completely new way, and using recycled material to create color-changing clothes. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that was really inspiring. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. I love the diversity of thought in across all of the different markets that these ideas have. I'm definitely proud to be a Triton right now.
So we have so much gratitude for everyone who has helped us. So again, we'll thank them. Um, huge thank you to our sponsors for helping uh, make this event happen. Uh, thank you to our judges for contributing your time, feedback, and asking such thoughtful questions. And thank you to our pitch competition reviewers and mentors. And thank you to the planning committee who really helped make this event happen. So lastly, we're just gonna transition um, and announce our, uh, our uh, winners. So bear with us as we go through this transition. Um, it's another technical wizardry that's going on. Um, here's our finalists again, Botticelli, Crater, Learn Sesh, Mize, Time, and Vibrant. And now I will introduce Paul Robin, um, who will announce our third, second, and first place winners. Thank you very much, Taylor. Um, you can all hear me, I hope, yes. So thank you, Taylor, and, and thanks for a masterful job of emceeing tonight. And uh, also thanks to all the judges. Um, really, really appreciate uh, the time and effort you put into this. So um, congratulations, first of all, to all of the finalists. You all did a fantastic job. Um, well done. But of course, there has to be winners. So in third place, we have Time for Survivors. Well done, congratulations, guys. In second place, we have Vibrant. Excellent job, well done, guys. And tonight, the 2020 winner of Triton Entrepreneur Night is in first place, Crater. Well done, Crater. Um, fantastic job to everybody. And then finally, I believe we have the Audience Choice Award, which I actually don't know yet, so. Revol Our Revolution. Excellent, well, well done everybody. Awesome, thanks Paul for announcing the winners for us. So um, we have one more winner to announce and that's the giveaway winner. So uh, we did have a $25 Amazon gift card for UCSD students who decided um, to sign up and show up tonight. So without further ado, Charles L and Vanessa M. So to claim your gift card, please take a screenshot of the Zoom webinar and send it to the basement at ucsd.edu to claim your prize. So thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, this video is available on Facebook. Uh, you can find us at uh, UCSD The Basement or UCSD Basement. Sorry, I said that wrong. It's on the slide here. Uh, for more information on all pitch competition teams and Audience Choice Award teams, um, you can visit uh, thebasement.com, which is UCSDBasement.com, also on this slide. Um, and stay connected with us. Follow us on social media, and we hope to see you again next year. Again, thank you so much for attending.